All right, let's do another AP Human Geography FRQ for Unit 3. We're talking about culture. Specifically, we're going to be looking at religion. It's Christmas time, the time I'm recording this. So this is more of a Christmas-focused FRQ, sort of, not really. We're talking about Christianity. We're also going to talk about Judaism and talk about religious diffusion and all kinds of cool stuff relating to culture. So our first part here, explain one historic cause for Christianity's presence in South America. So we look back at the map here. We can see that there's a lot of Christianity in South America. Particularly the Western Hemisphere has a lot of Christianity because of European colonization. It brought a lot of Europeans to these areas and they practiced Christianity. So they practiced it in the area and as well as they converted a lot of natives there. And of course they had children that were Christians and this led to a very, very high proportion of Christians in the North, North America and South America, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And of course, we see it across Europe as well and Australia, which was a British colony. So we see a lot of Christianity. Now we're focusing mostly on South America for this FRQ. And who colonized South America? Spain and the Portuguese. And a lot of students would probably say English or French because that's, that's who colonized North America. That's who we're probably most familiar with. But that's not really true when it comes to South America. So when we talk about the Christianity presence in South America, we link that back to imperialism. We're going to be focusing more on the Spanish and the Portuguese here. So the first easy response here is Christianity spread to South America during the colonization by Spain and Portugal, whose missionaries and settlers brought um, the Catholic religion to the region. You could probably get away with just saying Christianity. You don't have to say that it was specifically the Catholic denomination of Christianity. You could say that indigenous populations were converted to Christianity through coercion or assimilation policies or just kind of assimilation methods by European colonizers. You could say that these indigenous native populations assimilated to European culture, thus adopted and converted to Christianity. Catholic missionaries, such as Jesuits, you don't need that example. You could just say missionaries or Catholic missionaries to be more specific. Actively established missions to convert indigenous peoples and spread Christian teachings. Christianity's dominance was reinforced by Spanish and Portuguese colonial governments, which made the Catholic religion the official religion of their territories. And then finally, Christianity adapted and blended. When we talk about blending of cultural traits, we're thinking of syncretism, and it blended with local beliefs, and that facilitated its acceptance and long-term presence in the region. And what this means is that the natives, they had their own spiritual practices, and they brought in the Christian faith, particularly the Catholic faith. And so they took elements from the Catholic faith and elements of their indigenous spiritual faith and kind of blended them together. And that's where we think of syncretism in Christianity in South America. Part B, explain the degree that Christianity has on impacting the physical features of the cultural landscape for South America. So when I think of Christianity, one of the first things I think of is a church or a big cross structure. We see those a lot in the South where I'm from. We can see a lot of billboards with Bible verses or messages. And so Christianity definitely has a high degree of impact on the cultural landscape where it's present. And in South America, where it's very, very, very present, I'm sure it has a great impact on the cultural landscape. Something that's in South America is Christ the Redeemer, and that's a wonder of the world. So that shows a high Christian influence here. So to get this point, you would have to say either moderate to high degree. So either moderate or high degree as your answer. If you said low degree, you don't get any points. And you have to say a degree, either high degree or moderate degree, to get your point for this part. If you have no degree, you don't get the point. So why is it a moderate or high degree? Well, here's the first response. South America features numerous iconic cathedrals, which are Catholic churches, such as the Cathedral of Brasilia and the Cusco Cathedral, which dominate urban and rural landscapes. So you can just say the presence of cathedrals. These examples aren't needed. You can say large-scale religious Christian monuments like the Christ the Redeemer in Brazil. It serves as a defining landmark and symbol of faith in the region. Christian traditions have influenced the establishment of above-ground mausoleums and cross-adorned cemeteries throughout South South America. You could just say Christian cemeteries or cemeteries by churches, something like that as well. You don't have to be as specific. Many cities were historically planned around central plazas with prominent churches or cathedrals. That kind of links back to the first one. But if you go to Europe or you go to a lot of areas in South America, America, especially in Brazil, there's a lot of plazas and squares, and they have a main cathedral or a main church in them. 
religious pilgrimage sites such as the Sanctuary of Our Lady of Luan, of Luan in Argentina have shaped transportation networks as well as tourism. And they keep these religious structures here because they're a big component of their history and it brings in, of course, tourism. And a lot of churches are linked to roads or other transportation networks to get people to go to these churches and to get to them to go to these worship centers. They want to, of course, attract people. We talked about how Christianity is a universalizing religion. So just to kind of recap here, to get the point for this part, you had to say moderate or high degree and then back yourself up. Why does it impact the cultural landscape? How does it impact the cultural landscape? And one of these points here would be good. You don't have to be as specific, like give a ton of examples here, but you definitely need to say, oh, churches or churches in plazas. There's uh, cathedrals because we're talking about the Catholic religion specifically here. Part C, explain one reason for why the diffusion of Judaism across the world is lower than the diffusion of Christianity. So one of the big points we talk about in this course and in this unit is ethnic versus universalizing religions here. And we know that Judaism is an ethnic religion and Christianity is a universalizing religion. Now what does that mean? That means that Judaism does not seek convert converts and conversions and growth as much as Christianity does. Christianity is supposed to have this universal appeal and it seeks converts and to grow as big as possible and spread the message of the gospel to as many people as possible. So that's kind of what we're going to use to talk about our response for this question here. So an easy one you could have said is Judaism is an ethnic religion, meaning it's tied to a specific cultural or ethnic group and does not prioritize missionary work or conversion. And then kind of end that off, you could say, unlike Christianity, which is a universalizing religion, something like that. You could have said Judaism emphasizes maintaining cultural and religious traditions within the existing Jewish com community rather than seeking converts, further limiting its diffusion. I think most of y'all would probably have said the first two kind of combined and written a, maybe a good bit for this question because there's a lot you can talk about because we talk about and really emphasize that ethnic versus, versus universalizing distinction here. Jewish communities often face persecution and displacement, such as with the Holocaust, limiting their ability to establish widespread populations and spread their faith. If there's less of them, it's harder to spread their beliefs. The global Jewish population is much smaller than Christianity's. That is very true. There's over a billion Christians and definitely not a, over a billion Jewish people. I don't even think there's 100 million Jewish people. There's a way less than that number. And that can limit their diffusion and influence. Jewish religious practices such as dietary laws and the Sabbath observance can make assimilation and conversion conversion less common compared to Christianity's more broader flexibility. And that kind of relates to the denominations of Christianity. Denominations of Christianity have different beliefs. A lot of them are very flexible, especially compared to Judaism. Others are not so flexible, but some of them are. Part D, describe a specific type of expansion diffusion. So this is a very kind of a freebie part. You just kind of define a part, a type of expansion diffusion. So there are four different types of expansion diffusion you could have chosen, and we'll go through all four of them. So the first one you could have said is hierarchical diffusion, which is where ideas or practices or some kind of cultural trait spreads from one important or significant city, community, or person, like a celebrity, to another. Typically, it goes to a rural area or to less influential people or less wealthier people. And then reverse hierarchical diffusion is the opposite. It spreads from person to community or goes from a small community to a larger, more important community. It goes from rural to urban. Then we have contagious diffusion, which is just a spread from person to person or along a transportation line. And then finally, we have stimulus diffusion, which is where ideas are borrowed from one culture and altered by another culture. They are adapted as they go to new places and new people, like pizza. Pizza in Italy is very different than pizza in Chicago. Yeah, deep dish pizza there, which is really, really good. I've been to Italy too. Their pizza is also very, very good, but very, very different. It's changed. It's adapted as it's diffused to new areas. And a common characteristic across all four of these types of diffusion is that the idea or the practice, it grows in popularity here. Now, some people may have said relocation diffusion, and that's not correct because relocation diffusion is not a type of expansion diffusion because when something goes through relocation diffusion, it doesn't grow in popularity. Part E, explain one way that Judaism can undergo expansion diffusion, aka grow, in the modern world here. And we're thinking of the modern world, we're thinking of communication technologies, we're thinking of globalization, time-space compression, we're thinking of transportation technologies. So how can Judaism grow using elements of the modern world and globalization here? So you don't need to say the actual type of expansion diffusion because it doesn't ask you to, but it's good to know it and include it in your response to kind of beef it up. So here's an example of stimulus diffusion. Elements of Jewish culture, such as food traditions like bagels or Hanukkah celebrations, could be adopted and modified by non-Jewish communities. 
We look at hierarchical diffusion. Prominent Jewish leaders or cultural influencers could spread Jewish ideas or practices. So maybe there's a very famous celebrity like Jerry Seinfeld. He can spread Jewish cultural ideas or beliefs or practices through media or someone could do it through literature or even public speaking. We look at contagious diffusion through technological advances. Online platforms and social media like X or YouTube can allow Jewish traditions, teachings, and practices to reach more broader global audience, and that can encourage wider engagement and knowledge on Judaism. Part F, explain one way that religious holidays like Christmas serve as centripetal forces within an entity. So when we talk about centripetal forces, that piece, centripetal, we're thinking of pulling people together, unifying them. That's what a centripetal force does. So we're going to talk about how Christian, not Christian, Christmas unifies people. Christmas is a Christian holiday. So I was kind of right. First response here, religious holidays will bring people together through shared traditions, such as gathering, celebrations, or rituals, like opening presents. And that fosters a sense of belonging or sense of community. Celebrating holidays reinforces a collective cultural identity or a unifying cultural identity. And that can strengthen the bonds and interactions. It can strengthen the community, which is full of different individuals who share similar beliefs or customs, like the customs of Christmas, like getting those peppermint milkshakes at Chick-fil-A. That's a custom in my household. Activities like Charity drives, public events, and communal worship during religious holidays encourage collaboration and social cohesion. You could also just say that they encourage unification and service in tripetal forces. I'm kind of giving a very much more specific response here. Even in diverse societies where maybe there's a lot of different religions and not just Christianity, maybe Judaism is present, or Islam, or Buddhism, or Hinduism. Widely celebrated holidays like Christmas can unite people of various backgrounds through shared festive practices. There's a lot of atheists that celebrate Christmas. They don't see it as the, the birth of Christ like Christians do, but they still celebrate maybe with Christmas trees and opening presents and singing some Christmas carols. Holiday-related shopping market shopping, as well as markets like going to the mall and events can engage communities in shared economic activities, promoting a sense of togetherness. So this is talk about just how everyone's shopping during Christmas time. A lot of sales going on, a stress, getting the perfect gift, getting the turbo man for the little kid. Finally, holidays provide an opportunity for families to just come together, reinforcing personal and emotional connections that contribute to social unity. And all of these are different ways that Christmas can serve as a centripetal force. And these are broad and specific answers. You, There's a lot you could have written here. So this is not an exhaustive list, I would say. But you got to say something kind of along the lines of one of these six options here to get the point for this question. And then part G, this is kind of another, it's supposed to be a bit of a freebie, but if you've never been exposed to this type of question before, you might be a little confused on how to answer it. So describe one limitation of using the map shown and understanding the spatial distribution of religion. And just looking at the map, you see that it only shows Christianity. So a very common answer would probably say it doesn't show where other religions are located or what other religions are found, especially in the areas where there's not a lot of Christian populations like in China, India, Saudi Arabia, or Algeria. So it doesn't show other religions across the world. It doesn't show where they're located or how they're distributed. It doesn't show where Christianity is located within the countries. Maybe in the United States, there's Christians clustered in one side of the country over another. Maybe in the Congo, Christians are clustered in the south over the north. I know in Nigeria, the north is predominantly Islam, but the south is predominantly Christian here. It also doesn't tell us what branch of Christianity. Maybe there's a lot of Catholics. We see that in South America. But in the United States, we see a lot of Protestants. It doesn't show where other religions are located within countries as well. We're looking at a national scale of analysis here because the data is being compared at a country-by-country -country level here. So we don't know where other religions are located within these countries, as well as we don't know where Christianity is clustered or located within these countries as well. We're looking at the countries as a whole across the world. So that's the FRQ. What are some takeaways for this? Now, there are seven points on this FRQ because there's seven parts. Each part is one point. When talking about historical diffusion, you're either going to be thinking of colonialism, we may be thinking of trade, like the Silk Road or the Columbian Exchange, or we're talking about some technological inventions. And I'm not talking about the internet, that's more contemporary, but I'm talking stuff that came about as industrialization or mechanization, like the, like the, the seed plow, the cotton gin, or the printing press. Colonialism helped us on this FRQ particularly because it brought about Christianity to South America. Christianity is a large universalizing religion, and it seeks converts and growth. So when we see it grow and diffuse, we typically see it go through expansion diffusion. 
As Europeans colonized, they brought Christianity to their colonies through relocation diffusion and made efforts to convert indigenous populations to Christianity, which is contagious diffusion. Sometimes these populations can blend Christianity with elements of their indigenous cultures and spiritual practices, and that's stimulus diffusion. A great example of this is Day of the Dead in Mexico. It blends Catholic features and the saints with local spiritual customs. Other universalizing religions that you need to know is Islam, Buddhism, and Sikhism. Now, Judaism is a small ethnic religion. It doesn't see converts as it's typically located around its cultural hearth, which is its origin in Israel, and its relocation diffusion base. It doesn't typically grow through expansion diffusion. Hinduism is the other ethnic religion you need to know for this course, and it's also located around its hearth in South Asia. Relocation fusion is not expansion diffusion because the cultural trait doesn't expand. It doesn't grow in popularity as it diffuses, but it can expand in geographic prominence. So if European settlers are moving out of Europe to North America and they bring Christianity with them, it's going to grow in geographic prominence because it's going to be located in both Europe and North America. Religions have significant impacts on cultural landscapes, particularly with architecture, such as with churches or crosses on buildings or Bible verses on signs. Centripetal forces unite people, and this can be seen through common religion, common history, national holidays, or economic growth. Centrifugal forces with an F divide people. That can be seen through religious diversity or linguistic diversity. Maybe there's mountains that physically divide people, or maybe an ocean. We could see an unstable government as well dividing people on maybe how to proceed in the government. Time-space compression. We didn't really talk about this, but it kind of can help us answer some of these questions, especially when we think about modern-day diffusing, because it's made the world way more interconnected and feel smaller, more compressed, due to the advancements in communication and transportation technologies. I can travel from the United States to Italy in less than a day, and I can talk to someone in Italy in less than five seconds, and that used to not be possible. The internet and social media has allowed people from various countries and cultures to interact with one another, such as a, a Christian in the United States and a Jewish person in Israel, and they can exchange cultural traits and ideas.